of sin, the impressed sin, the depraved old man, the sinful nature, the impressed sin, the uncontrollable, overdriven body of sin that dwells within me that does it. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That's why the crucifixion is so important. And Christ, as we identify with him in the crucifixion today, that body of sin will be destroyed. Give me a good, good amen. amen. When you believe that and you say that to the hearing of everybody and to the hearing of Satan, as we pray and take that old man, that body of sin, and we take it to Calvary, there will be a death crucifying blow on the old man, even today in our lives in Jesus' name. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And I'm reading there to you from verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Once again, it's talking about our participation in that crucifixion of Christ. Don't just leave Christ there on the cross alone by himself. Come and partake of it. Come and experience that crucifixion yourself. Let that old man, let that old nature, let that body of sin, let that impressed sin be dealt with, crucified in your life today. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Nevertheless, I live. He's come to the resurrection side. He says, yes, the old man has been crucified. He said, did you hear my story when I was weak? Did you hear my story when I was under the control of that body of sin? Did you hear my story? I wished to do good. I couldn't do it. I wished to go the right direction. I couldn't do it. There was another power controlling me. But now things are different. Because now I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. When that crucifixion takes place in your life, a new life will come. A new spirit will come. There will be a new spring board in your heart. You'll launch out and then you'll be able to do that which is right. And your story will no more be what I would, I do not. And the things I hate, that I do. No, that is before you identified with the crucifixion of Christ. But when today you come to Calvary once again, when today you experience that same crucifixion of Christ and that conquering power coming from Calvary is transferred into your life, you will be able to say the life I now live. It is no more I that live that life, but Christ that liveth in me. And then it says, I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And I'm reading there from verse 24, Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And they that are Christ, those who belong to Christ, those who claim Christ as their Savior, those who have Christ as their Lord, those who did not behold, only to behold Christ dying at Calvary, those who go to the side of Christ and said, I'm dead with him. I'm crucified with him. I am buried with him. And I'm risen up with him. Just so identify, participate with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is the experience we have. Here is the experience we have every day. We demonstrate every day wherever we go. That old man does not have power over us anymore. That old man does not conquer us anymore. That evil sin propensity doesn't have power over us anymore. Because according to that Galatians chapter 5 verse 24, it says, And they that belong to Christ, they have crucified the flesh, with the affections and the laws. What does that mean? What does that mean? You have crucified the flesh. 
That means that all the works of the flesh, all those things, they're no more. Look at verse 19, what they have crucified. What? They have gotten rich of. Oh, because they have crucified the flesh. And so the works of the flesh has no authority over them, has no hold over them, has no control over them, has no power over them anymore. And as we look at this list of the works of the flesh, if any of them still has hold on you, that's an evidence you need Calvary once again. And Calvary will do a great work in your life in Jesus' name. As we look at the works of the flesh, if any of these things still have any control, a controlling power, an overbearing power, a kind of unshakable power, you can't shake yourself away from me and you say, I am helpless. I don't know what I will do. Because even though I don't want any of these works of the flesh, I still find them present. Don't worry, we'll get to Calvary, and as we get to Calvary, everything will lose its power, its control, its hold upon your life, even today in Jesus' name. Look at them. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery. And remember, all who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. They have crucified adultery. Adultery is not once mentioned in their lives anymore. You live the overcoming life. Then, verse 19, fornication. When you visit Calvary, and when you have that crucifixion, fornication has no interest or attraction in your life anymore. Uncleanness, unclean language, unclean pictures, pornographic, dirty pictures. You don't have any interest in that anymore. Whether people are with you or not, whether people see you or not, it doesn't draw you anymore because this is the flesh that is crucified by those who visit Calvary. And then lasciviousness, idolatry. Hey, you're not going to have any interest in idolatry anymore. They're not going to tell you there's one juju somewhere, there's one man somewhere, yeah, there's one uh, person that is sitting on the ground somewhere and uh, writing some things on the side. You're not going to be interested in that anymore. Idolatry is part of the flesh that is crucified and witchcraft. That has no hold upon your life. One, you are not interested in witchcraft anymore. And witchcraft will never have any power over your life anymore in Jesus' name. And if any witch tries to put anything on you, it's wasting time because we have visited Calvary. And once we visit Calvary and we identify, we participate in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, witchcraft becomes powerless in every life in Jesus' name. And then it says, hatred. That's not going to be your heart anymore. That is the love. Love comes through Calvary. And love comes through that crucifixion. And when you are visited Calvary and the old man is crucified, it is the old man that entertains hatred. It is the old man that entertains bitterness. It is the old man that entertains the thought of revenge, the thought of retaliation. But when that old man is crucified with Christ, and now the new man is risen up, the new man only knows about love, about compassion, about mercy, about forgiveness, about forbearance. The new man does not entertain hatred. Hatred is dealt away with as we participate in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it goes on, it says, variance, emulation. That he is trying to emulate and copy the people of the world acting like they are and living that they live and drinking what they drink and smoking what they smoke and then going to the nightclubs like they do. You no, know, because of visited Calvary. And then he talks about wrath, anger, strife, sedition, 
heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, rebellies. Those are the works of the flesh. Come back to verse 24. And they that are Christ's, they that belong to Christ, they that identify with Christ, they have crucified the flesh and the affections and the laws. From today, we're free. I said we are free. And that freedom will continue forever in our lives in Jesus' name. Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 14. Our partnership in his crucifixion. Our participation in his crucifixion. Because he was crucified and we identify with him. And then with you, we are crucified with him. Look at verse 14 of chapter 6. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Actually, there are three great enemies of the believer. Satan, self, and the world. And the world will try to have authority. The world will try to have overbearing power. The world will like to have a final control over you. But when you come to Calvary once again and you identify with the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, the world is crucified unto you and you are crucified to the world. That means the crucified world will not have any control over you anymore. I said the world will not have control over you anymore. Then you are free. Because you're crucified to the world, and the world unto you, and all those practices of the world, and all those dirty, corrupting things in the world will not have any hold, any control, any authority, any power over you anymore. God forbid that I should glory except saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Verse 15, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature will now become new. The old is gone. The old man is crucified, and the old life is done away with a new life, a new spirit, a new direction. The new man now gets up, and that new man now lives in the victory, the victory of the cross. And now we're looking at Jesus Christ, and where he goes, we go. What he does, we do. What he says, we say, because now we're living on this right hand side of Calvary. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And I read there from verse 1 Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Who do we look at now? At the time of temptation, who do we look at? Tell me out loud. At the time when it appears discouragement is coming, who are you looking at? Jesus, at the time when the old man wants to rear up its ugly head again, seeking to control your life again, who do you look at? Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. The crucified man does not just give in and give up to sin and yield to the pressure of sin and the world and Satan anymore because victory has come. And I pray you will enjoy that victory in Jesus' name. Number one, the prediction of his crucifixion. Number two, our participation in his crucifixion. Number three, now the power in his crucifixion. The power in his crucifixion. Have you ever thought about the power, the outcome, the result, the effect of that crucifixion? I'm going to read a familiar passage to you and then we're going to look at that passage and try to see one important word there and see the result of that crucifixion upon your life in my life too and in the life of the people of God, the people that know the Lord the effect of that crucifixion the result of that crucifixion, the outcome of that crucifixion, the power that emanates and flows from Calvary as a result of that crucifixion. And I pray today, as we see and perceive and understand this power coming from Calvary and coming to your life to give you that victory of the crucified it will never lack again in your life in Jesus' name. If you understand this, if you can perceive this, if you can see this in your mind's eye, your victory will be a permanent victory. Your overcoming life will be an ongoing overcoming life in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Genesis chapter 3. We've read it before. We need to read that again and pick one word there. The word that brings victory into your life. The word that transfers power. Power from Calvary into your life. That power will come there today in Jesus' name. Good, good. Amen. Genesis chapter 3. I'm looking at verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise, that's the word, that's the word, that's the word. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You find that word bruise coming up two times. That when crucifixion takes place, number one, there is the bruising of the heel of Christ. But number two, the bruising of the heel of Christ will result into the bruising of what? Of the head of the serpent, of the head of Satan, of the head of the devil. Pick up that word books and see the outcome of the crucifixion and see the result of that crucifixion the heels of Christ were bruised he was pierced he was crucified he was hung on the cross he died on the cross that was the worst that Satan could do, and it was to bruise his heel. Isaiah chapter 53, to bruise, to bruise the heel of Christ. Let's see that demonstrated. Let's see that working out. Isaiah 53 verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgression. 
that word wounded, and that's the word to bruise and to wound. He was bruised for our iniquities. That's the word. The crucifixion was for iniquity. The, the crucifixion was for transgression. The crucifixion was for our sins. The crucifixion was the bruising of the heel of Christ. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, and with his stripes, and with his stripes, I am healed. Let's look now. At Romans chapter 16, you remember the reason why God allowed the heel of Christ to be bruised is so that the edge of the serpent will be bruised. And that's what happened at Calvary. If you see it right now, it's going to be your experience. I said it will be your experience. In Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And the God of peace shall, shall, tell me, shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. That's the consequence of Calvary. That's the result of Calvary. That's the outcome of Calvary. Yes, the feet of Christ had been bruised. Christ had been crucified. But the result of that, the outcome,